this is Matthew, and I'm here to introduce our second part for Auburn Prison. And the in the first part we covered much of the history, and now in this uh, section we're going to be covering fingerprinting, and we're going to be uh, looking into Copper John. I'm going to find out about him. I'd like to introduce to you Unearthly Upstate Round Two for Auburn Prison. All right. Hope you enjoy, and thank you for listening. But what also happened in the 1880s? Well, what we've mentioned a couple times on this podcast, Auburn became a place to, for electrocution. The last hanging was done on August 21st, 1885. So this was Franz Joseph Petnicki. On Friday, August 21st, Franz Joseph Petnicki was hung. He was the last one hung in Auburn. And it was quite the affair. Outside, it was public hanging, so you had people coming to see that. A circus came to town because of the hanging. So there were thousands of people in there to watch the hanging and then go watch the elephants. Okay, that's the, that's mm. the attitude he had at that time. Now, fast forward five years later, almost exactly five years later, on Friday, August 6th, 1890, it was the first electrocution in the world was held in Auburn. And the convict who was uh, the first one to be electrocuted was William Kemmer for the murdering of his wife, Tilly. And it was a different story. The electrocution happened in private. It happened in the early morning as well. Only 25 people were invited to witness it. The warden and staff members were needed to operate the equipment. They requested everybody be silent during the electrocution and... Some became horrified at the electrocution. If I remember right, this was botched pretty badly. Really? Yeah, it was botched. He he suffered. Yeah. What what's uh, what measure of voltage was it? That the I was don't remember, but I just remember he they did it wrong, and he he suffered. He he suffered an agonizing death. And they, they went through one one electrocution, and then uh, what he was. They upped still, the vol- yeah, still they, alive? And they upped the voltage. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty bad. It was still considered more humane than hanging or gun. They were even they were still doing firing squad in some of these places. So yeah, so that was the first one. We covered the second one, I believe. Fifty five persons died in an electric chair in Auburn between August 6, eighteen ninety, and May first, nineteen sixteen. Sing Sing continued them until nineteen sixty three. Unfortunately, nobody ever recorded how the convicts you know if how they experienced the electrocutions you know when they went on that's why i think they were trying to keep it as quiet as possible from the convicts because it was they were like i said done very early in the morning before the work day began and because they had to get the electric chair in there auburn also became one of the first prisons to become fully with electric lights and everything so there was there was a positive that came out of it i guess yeah they had to wire the place for electricity right in order to zap people yeah. So, yeah. Okay. We, we're now in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. So now they they do have a lot of foreign prisoners and they do, you know, immigrants and that. Now the education is expanded. It goes beyond just reading the Bible. And these prisoners are given remedial education at this point. Mm-hmm. The lockstep was finally abandoned in the 20th century. But they're now, they were still marched in columns of two, but they weren't expected to be in step and, you know. That, I think, has now changed where they have to keep in certain paths mm-hmm. while they walk through. The black and white uniforms were abolished in 1904, and they were given solid gray uniforms. Of course, made in the prison shops as well. Mm-hmm. The gray uniforms stayed until 1971, and we'll get into why they changed in 1971. But basically, in 1971, an event happens, not at Utica, uh, not at Auburn, but it does have replicate you know it does go throughout the whole system and they switched to green uniforms with zippers finally 
<laughs> okay. But they'll find a use for those, too. Oh, yes. So, talk about some, uh, we already mentioned the riot that happened in the past by the public. Uh-huh. In 1921, there was a race riot among the inmates. Uh, that's all I got out of it. There's really no, I couldn't find much more information on that. But. Yeah, it's details on these reports. Very yeah. spotty in yeah. some places. But in 1929, two uh, riots occurred. July 28th, which happened to be the hottest day of the year, an inmate sprayed acid in an officer's face and then gained access to the arsenal. Four prisoners did escape at that time, and a riot spread throughout the population, and the workshops were set on fire. Six buildings destroyed. After several hours, the rioters were subdued and locked in their cells. Now, the fires were brought under control with the Auburn Fire Department. Two inmates were killed, one wounded. Two officers were shot. One was burned by the acid, and one was beaten. Three Auburn firemen were also injured, and they lost a pumper truck in the in this as well. Now, the reason this happened, it was overcrowded at this point. The capacity was 1,280, what, sorry, the capacity was 1,285 inmates. They had 1,768 and so slightly more than the thing. Yeah. And also sentences were getting longer. Mm-hmm. So, it was, yeah, it was not a good situation. On the coldest day of the year, December 11th, Warden Edgar Jennings went into the main yard to investigate rumors of impending trouble. And he took six guards and a foreman with him, and they were taken hostage by convicts. Some of these inmates were armed with guns concealed since July. So they waited to do this. Mm-hmm. Principal Keep of George Dunford was approaching the trouble, uh, approaching where the convicts had the the uh, warden and the other guards captured, and he was shot and killed. State troopers were then called in. Uh, eventually, the riots were subdued with the use of gas. Eight prisoners were killed. Nine persons, including two inmates, were wounded. Three of the convicts were later executed at Sing Sing. And another interesting tidbit, and I only I found this on Facebook of all places. There is a newsreel. That was probably the first newsreel with sound was filmed at December 11th, 1929, outside of the prison. And the newsman is reporting what is going on. I'm going to have it in our notes if you go to our blogger. It'll be listed, but it's it was the first sound film to capture an event as it happened. Wow. And it's really interesting. You, you watch it, and you just see a lot of people milling around and all that, but you start hearing people. And, like, the one guy's, like, reporting, but he's got somebody, like, whispering in his ear, oh, there's been gunfire. Oh, there has been gunfire. You know, it's really interesting. And then you hear well, something we're going to talk about later. You hear somebody say, oh, look look at Copper John. Look at Copper John. We'll mm-hmm. get to Copper John. But it was really interesting to watch. It's like a 12-minute film. I found it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like I said, we'll have the link to it. So you're kind of interested in seeing this nice historical event yeah. that happened. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Now we're going to skip ahead to another major event that, led to another event on uh, November 4th, 1970. The civil rights movement was happening. So we're going to back up a little bit. The civil rights movement was happening. And the black inmates at Elbow Prison wanted a black solidarity day observance, but it was denied. So they decided to basically have a strike on November 4th, 1970. They refused to go to work or school on that day. And then they took over the main yard, gang controlled three cell blocks, the kitchen and the mess hall. 43 employees were taken hostage, four of whom were assaulted. They got control of the public address system and made speeches. Here's the interesting part. None of them tries to escape. They're more mad that their request has been denied than trying to escape, which I found interesting. So Hmm. when Deputy Commissioner Harold Butler told the inmates that the state troopers were ready to retake the facility, they surrendered. And Warden Harry Fitz agreed to study their grievances, and he did not retaliate. That, I think, is a big step right there. He realized what the grievance was. He realized, yeah, the prison probably dropped the ball on that. They should have just gave him that day and decided, okay, we'll end this. But a lot of the inmates who were part of that moved to Attica, and a year later was the Attica prison riot which was also the impetus to change the uniform to green. And the main reason was, we may go into the Attica riot later, in a nutshell, when all hell broke loose. You had smoke from gas. You had gunfire going off. Those gray uniforms were hard to see. And uh, anybody who wants to read up on it, it was a horrible event. So, But it did lead to a lot of changes. Like I said, we may cover that eventually, uh, sometime. We'll see. Right. We'll see how you like the Auburn stories. In 1970, Auburn Prison drops the prison from its name and becomes the correctional facility. It's still there. 
It's still mm-hmm. in Auburn. It's still going. Uh, it's still right in the middle of town. It's still right in the middle of town. It's, it's got its issues. It's an old building. It's got issues. I mean, recently they had a major outbreak of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Not just among the prisoners, but the workers as well. So it's it still makes news. <laughs> Sometimes not very positive news, but it still makes news. But it is definitely a, a, a part of New York history that's interesting. And there are a couple things related to it. And one it led to the American system of fingerprint identification. Mm. So we got to go back and talk to this guy named James Park. Now, James Park lived in Whitehall. Uh, he was a merchant. His wife takes off. He loses a lot of his money. So he moves to Auburn with his 16-year-old son who was suffering from tuberculosis at the time. So he, he moves to Auburn not in a good situation, okay? So he has to take a job, and he takes a job as a guard. All right, so here's James Park. You just get, just put James Park in the Auburn prison at this point, okay? And his <laughs> son, keep his son's name in mind, too. His son, Edward, too. Remember his son's Edward's name. So at this point, when it came to, I guess, what would you call it? The paperwork involved with keeping track of the convicts. They used what was called the Bertillon system. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. It's French. And it was developed by Bertillon. And he took five member measurements. All right. Head length, head breadth, length of middle finger, length of the left foot, and length of a cubit. I don't know what the cubit part is. Okay. <laughs> but those were the five A cubit me- is a, a, a unit of measurement right. that was used by uh, the Phoenicians. Sumerians? Yeah, but I want, I don't know why it is part of this, you know. Yeah, it, it is it's strange. Weird. Why right. would you use cubits in anything? But of course, this was all, this yeah. all ties into things like eugenics. Uh-huh. Well, the eventually, yeah. That, but... that the idea that you can profile a person's behavior by their physical features. Right. So Bertian also took what are now known as mug shots, and he put that information together. So he had the mug shot and the measurements on the cards. Mm-hmm. So this was being used for identification of convicts and of anybody who's committing a crime eventually. So in 1895, in Albany, they, they opened the Bertillon Bureau. Mm-hmm. Okay. In five years, it becomes the largest criminal identification repository in North America with over 50,000 cards on file. Two years later, the files are literally spilling into the hallway. <laughs> they start getting a larger staff, mainly women who worked on filing these and keeping track and, you know, so it, it was hard to keep up with this. So they needed to streamline it. They needed to find a better way to keep track of the inmates. Mm-hmm. So they had to find a better way to basically streamline the whole thing and maybe even streamline the identification process. Right. Okay. So chief clerk, Charles Baker and Dr. R.B. Lamb, who was the superintendent of Dan Morrow State, State Hospital at the time, they were sent to Paris to to talk, you know, to find what the latest enhancements were of this process. So they get to Paris and they're looking over things and okay, it looks kind of like what we're doing. There's really nothing here, but they hear, oh, up in England they're using fingerprints. Mm-hmm. Oh, now they're in cure. Now they're curious. So they go to England. They go to Scotland Yard to find out. More about this. Scotland Yard would not let them inside. <laughs> apparently, apparently, two guys from New York, you know, penal system weren't big enough, you know, to go in for Scotland Yard. So, they're walking around London and they find a bookshop and uh, have a couple of yanks. Uh, yeah, uh, but the, about the bookshop uh, in the bookshop they found the classification used of fingerprints by Edward R. Henry, C- CSI, and the fingerprint directories by Sir Francis Galton. So, so they get back to Albany. Oh, they're like, okay, we got we got to work on these these files or get out of control. But they give the books to James Park. Do they now? Isn't that interesting? Now yeah. it's not sure why James Park, this lowly prison guard in Auburn, got it, but it may have been that Park may have been friends with Baker. Oh, okay, it's not a hundred percent proven, but that. It may have been a friendship thing. Park is still employed at Auburn. Oh, this guy what? with the books needed a quick way to ditch him. Yeah. Well, he was still officially employed in Auburn, but Edward and him were living in Albany. Mm. So they kind of gave him a new position. <laughs> James and Edward start to teach themselves fingerprint classification. Oh. So then on March 3rd, 1903, 
James Park is granted permission to set up a fingerprint file oh. in the Burfield Bureau. This fingerprint file, again, same thing, taking the mugshot, but this time including the fingerprints on it, probably taking not taking the left, you know, left middle finger measurement out of there when we come on. Mm-hmm. But James began to spend more time with his fingerprint files, and eventually he represented the state in the World Exposition of St. Louis in 1904. Edward Park joins the Department of Prisons as a parole officer okay. in Auburn. And then he takes over the fingerprint files from his father. So these two are really fundamental in developing how the fingerprint files were used, not just in New York State, but all through the United States as well. Shifting the emphasis of this profile to recording the physical aspects that actually mattered. Right, exactly. Like like the fingerprints. Yeah. You know, because they're unique to each person. Measuring the middle, okay, measuring your middle finger. Okay, first of all, where are you measuring from? Yeah. And second of all, you're going to have measuring bias. Exactly. As well, you know, going back to what you're saying, like, oh, you could shoot, fight, figure out if somebody was evil by the, you know, the size Lumps of the head. on their head. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of that bias going on as well. So, yeah, the fingerprints, good. They probably went back to what we consider normal measurements. Mm-hmm. You know, their cert, you know, their height, their weight. Right. You know, yeah. shoe shot, you know, what we hear now. Exactly. So Edward takes over from his father, takes the, the, the fingerprinting uh, bookkeeping over, and he actually goes to the Panama Exposition. Oh. And now when he comes back, they have to replace all the Bourgeois files with the fingerprinting files. <laughs> and <laughs> really? he, they did it. They did it. Over the next decade... Parks was visiting every prison in New York. He went to the World, Ex- World Exhibition of St. Louis. He finally returns to Whitehall. Not a good ending for either man, though. Uh, James Park died a bitter and broken man. And Edward committed suicide. Oh, boy. I wish I had a little more information on it, but I found that interesting that this lowly prison guard in Auburn was given these two books and said, here, figure this out. Here you go. And no, he did. Nothing will probably come of it here. Let's give yep. it to this, you know, lower level employee. Yep. Well, now. <laughs> <laughs> you make something out of it. That's funny. And then that system was used well into the 1990s. Mm-hmm. Hats off to the parks. Okay. Sure. Now we're going to end on a lighter note. We got to end on a lighter note. Right. Uh, we have to talk about Copper John. I mentioned Copper John earlier. You know, sort of a lighter note, but geez. Sort of a lighter note. Copper John is kind of the nickname the Auburn Prism has. Because Copper John is a revolution, a statue of American Revolutionary War soldier. Mm-hmm. He stands eight feet, eight and a half inches tall. So larger than life. Yep. And his rifle is 11 feet tall. Mm-hmm. Okay. The first Copper John was was made in 1821 by the convicts, and it was wrecked on top of the administration building. It was made of wood. Well, that didn't last too long. About 27 years later, in 1848, it was in pretty rough shape. So they take the wooden one down. In need of replacement. Yeah. yeah. So in 1841, it, it really didn't, you know, weather too good. It was a wooden one. I mean, sorry, in 1848, the wood was falling apart. They take mm-hmm. it down, and they make a new one out of copper. Hence, Copper John. Okay? Right. So, Copper John is up there. 1938, they knock down the old administration building, put a new one up, and Copper John was repainted, placed on top. Well, something happens in 2004. The statue's been there, right? Yeah, ages. It's been there over 100 years now. It's only been removed since 1938. Long time. Long time. No complaints. No complaints. And somebody or someone notices that he supposedly is atomically correct. I can tell you from from personal experience Mm -hmm. with being with the third New York over at Fort Stanley Mm -hmm. and wearing those clothes. Yep. Those breeches, they don't leave anything to the imagination. So it was probably less. Just check out my photographs. It was probably less of him being anatomically correct, but they were, they did a correct interpretation of the. uh, Well, yeah. yeah. I saw, I've seen pictures prior to the 2004. I really don't see it. It looks to Neither me like I. the breeches you would wear, like you said, when you were volunteering mm-hmm. at Port Stanwix. Yeah. Maybe because we were used to that, I'd be like, I don't see it. But it causes a problem. People are complaining. 
Yeah, well, there, nobody knows who's complaining. Who yeah, complained? I, I, would, we don't have it on record who complained about the statues. Right. Bulge. But the New York State decides, uh, you got to do something about it. Oh, this causes a problem. There are T-shirts made that the COs wear that say, hmm, save Copper Johns Johnson. <laughs> And this is the early 2000s. This is the early 2000s. 2000, 2004. Okay. This thing was up there through the 50s. At a time when you think this sort of oh, uh, nitpicking, yeah. prudy sort of attitude would arise. Exactly. But no. 2004. 2004 this happened. Well, he was removed. Copper John was removed in August and corrected is the in, term in, I'm going to use. The, the statue was ground down. Ground down and replaced. Poor, poor Copper John. And I agree with you, Matt. I, the pictures I've seen, I don't see. I don't see it. I, I, I don't see it. Before I don't the see before it. and afters. Yeah. I, yeah like, he looks like a Ken doll now. I mean, it's, yeah. Oh, well, he, he, he looks like those breeches were uh, now uh, tailored to be slacks. Something exactly. like that. <laughs> you know, with, complete with pleats and, you know, yeah. the, the, the zipper fly and all. But, yeah, it just... I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't quite look right anymore. So, I mean, I, we do have to talk about, you know, Oliver in prison is very ingrained. Like I said, the, the town wanted it, which is very rare. You know, yeah. you don't hear many towns going, we want a prison. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they wanted one. And it's still known as the prison city. Yeah. You know, you know, there's uh, a couple breweries down there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they've made a Copper John beer, you know. Probably. Now, as for ghost stories, and, you know, the reason you're listening to us, <laughs> couldn't find any. I'm sure there are stories. I'm sure the inmates have stories. <laughs> I mean, it's an old building. It's old. There's probably some things, yeah. some stories that haven't been related because right. it's still uh, a, yeah. presently a functioning facility. I mean, I know. So you're not going to have people risking their jobs right. relating a ghost story. I know someone who knows someone who works there. <laughs> and if I wanted to, I could have bugged them and found out if there was any stories, but I decided yeah. not to. Uh, but th so right as of right now, there are no tales coming out of Auburn. Like I said, there probably are. Right, exactly. It's just nothing is out there on the Internet. Nothing was easy to find. Uh, but it led me to wonder if they ever do close Auburn down. Yeah. Let's say... It finally gets to the point where, like, no, it's going to be cheaper just to close it down than try to rehabilitate it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it'll build a new prison in Auburn. Who knows? No, let's, let's just let's just go with this, this, this. They build a new prison in Auburn, move the inmate population there, and you got the old prison. Absolutely. I think it's going to be, if they ever did that, that would be awesome because Eastern State Penitentiary, think about that. Oh, yeah. You've yeah. got all those old prisons who have you know, wonderful tours and that. Yes, Auburn would be... You're going to wind up with ghost stories. Oh, Auburn would be wonderful for that. Here's the ghost of the man who died after he was dunked in the tank. Exactly. That sort of thing. Yeah. Or here's... This is when the riots happened and these are the people. Yeah. Uh, exactly. right, yeah, ghosts of all the people who got killed in the riots or, uh, you know, yeah. or oh, died yeah. in the prison and maybe met with accidents, got electrocuted. Oh, yeah. That sort of thing. I mean, let's talk about the, the, some of the people that have been there. I mean, we... we Let had... me ask you, um, yeah. do they still have the, the electric chair sitting there, or did they remove that? I am not ending? sure. Or do they do they have old Sparky? The old Sparky's Sparkler? in Sing Sing. Oh, that's... <laughs> you know what I mean. I know. Anyway, <laughs> you know, they probably have that that area, you know, walled yeah. off, probably. I, I'm not sure. You know, maybe I could ask my, you know, the person I know who knows the person I know, you know could find out. But I I didn't see anything. They probably removed it. But then again, it's such an old facility. You're right. They could have blocked it. How many it. executions by electric chair? That oh, was it 55? Oh, my goodness. Dozens of Something people. Something like that. Um, let me check my notes. That's why I'm clicking. That's You've my got computer. dozens of souls there. 55. Associated, yeah, 55 mm -hmm. deaths associated yeah. with this one item. If you talk to the ghosters. Yeah. Well, yeah, just, that's... well just think about the, the two people we've covered before. 
if they, they they ever did this to Alden Prison. You have Schlagos. Yeah, Leon Schlagos, who assassinated President Kit McKinley. Yeah, he was electrocuted there. Mm-hmm. Right. You had Chester Gillette, who murdered Grace Brown. Yep. He was held there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to find the older ones here. Those are the two that we've covered. There's been other ones. There's been more modern ones too. Yeah, I did. Uh, oh, one of, one of the more famous ones recently is David David Sweats there. Sweets there. Mm-hmm. He was one of the guys who escaped from Damora. Oh. So yeah, he's there now. Yeah. And they've got they've got a, they've had a few uh, mob bosses there and. But for a lot of people, oh, the sentencing yeah. to Auburn Prison was the end of the line. Oh yeah, it's it's one of yeah, mm. it is definitely definitely. So there's a lot. You can look up their inmates. They've had some very famous people there. So so I like I said we had to cover this because it is a big part. We've mentioned it so many times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've mentioned how it kind of affected everything else and, and as we cover more true crimes we know it's going to come up more yep we might do sing sing i don't know i would like to do dan mora dan mora's mm-hmm. another one and that's an interesting prison layout actually mm-hmm. uh now was that after the auburn style or was it a different a different paradigm that it's laid that? out a little different okay mainly because where the location is uh-huh i mean the auburn the Auburn Correctional Facility is right in town, right in the town, uh, right yeah. there. I mean, you can't miss it. Oh, it's right in the center. You can't miss yeah. It. yeah, I've driven, uh, when I had jobs out that way. Yeah, you can't miss uh, it. <laughs> years ago, I used to drive by it every day. Yeah, yeah you can't miss it. Dan hmm. Mora is way, stuck way up in Clinton County, out in the, literally out in the boondocks. Yeah. In some of those, you know, Godforsaken place. Right. All you had to do is watch Escape from Dead Mora. They filmed it, that, it there. You know what it's that, like. Oh, yeah. Isn't that that place with all that bare rock? Yeah. Along the side, and it's got this beautiful view. I mean, Dead Mora, yes, but, there, it's right there in the city as well. But when you go into the actual facility, mm-hmm. it's much larger. It's yeah. very open. It's very bare. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was stricken with how bare it was up there. Right. Yeah. yeah. So... We do have quite a variety of prisons in New York. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, we might. I would, maybe we should do Bedford because that was one, that's one of the females, one of the first female ones, oh, okay. and that's had its own famous ones too. We could do Bedford as well. Right. So I guess we're gonna have to wrap this up. Uh, okay. All right. What else can we say about? Well, Auburn it was, you know, it's interesting that that Auburn, you know, Auburn. There was also the Pennsylvania system that came out as well, and there was kind of competition between it and. Mm-hmm. Auburn. I didn't go into that too much because, boy, that is another podcast. That if we want to go into the history of prisons and prison reform and all that, that's where I'll discuss it. <laughs> but they they were the competing, comp- you know, they were competing for how prisoners are treated at this oh, time. Okay. Like I said, it's it's very old. It's got its problems still. You know, that's for sure. A lot of you know, infrastructural problems. Yeah. You know the. Uh, the physical plant, for one. Mm-hmm. But you I... Know, that, yeah, the, the deterioration of that. Yeah. I mean, uh, originally constructed back in the, 19, the 1820s. Mm-hmm. Right, when, uh, you know... And then it saw refurbishments throughout the decades, and then, you know, finally you know, replaced. Right. But, you know, fraught with its own physical problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, as well. You know, with just the, the day-to-day upkeep of the place. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. It's, uh, it's one of the biggest facilities. So it's it's got a lot of issues for being the oldest. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if they'll ever get around to refurbishing it like it needs to be refurbished uh-huh, because yeah. you've got a lot of logistics with doing that. Where are you going to move the inmates? Oh my, yeah. While you know, you, while you update it piecemeal. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you could them, so you could shut down one of the dorms, right? But you still got to move that population somewhere. Exactly, which means you're going to have a, a the population concentrated in one area, whereas right. it was spread out before. And that's going to cause its own problems. Right. And then you've got the risk of when you're bringing contractors in. Because mm-hmm. yeah. you are going to have to bring contractors in. Yeah, absolutely. Part of the reason the escape from Dan Mora happened is the contractors weren't locking their equipment down like they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. So if you get a lax situation like that, you might end up a lot of escape. There is a lot of things to consider. That It would be nice if they refurbish it. If they ever decide to close it down, I hope somebody turns it into a facility like you have with the Western State of Pennsylvania and open it up to ghost tours and open mm-hmm. it up. It's a it's a major, major historical uh, building there. 
I mean, Auburn has got some great history, not just with the prison. Mm -hmm. And I know we're going to be covering more in Auburn eventually. It That's really what a lot of people know Auburn for, is right. the prison. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Oh, correctional facility. No, correctional. Yeah, because, of, uh, because of the cost of upkeep, we're mm -hmm. hearing that Albany is going to be closing down at least a couple facilities. In well, they the already state. they already have. They did Cuomo. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I want to say it was almost ten years ago. Closed a bunch of them down mm -hmm. because the prison population had declined in New York. Mm -hmm. Some of those were turned over to drug rehab. Some of them had become uh, sex offender rehabilitation mm -hmm. places. I think there's one. There's one or two that are still yeah. not sold. Uh, oh, okay. You know, they're still out. You know, they. But the population had gotten to the point it, it, those places it it was coming to more expensive to keep them open for the little amount of inmates they were getting. Right, exactly. And, and you, yeah, and there's the there's the cost of upkeep there, right there. Yeah, yeah. For the for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But it's it's an interesting thing. Uh, it really is. Like I said, I wanted to cover it because a lot of our true crime ones will eventually come back to here yeah. <laughs> so and maybe maybe one of these days if they ever decide to mm -hmm. move it or I, I don't want to i don't want to see the place destroyed there's too much history there yeah absolutely. it would be if they decide to ever close it down make it an historic site do the ghost tours the place is like a fortress you could yes, it is. Uh, probably make an armory out of it or something oh like yeah there's there's a lot of stuff you could do so well i think we're going to end it on there and like I said, oh, right. okay. All righty. Well, that's the Auburn Correctional Facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for listening to our Ghastly Podcast. Bye. Thank you for listening to Unearthly Upstate. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Patreon, and on our webpage. We are also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Sprecher, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. Please like, share, and view on your favorite platform. Unearthly Upstate is an Animator Liar production. The show is produced by Mari and Matt Minette, with purring provided by Honey and Lloyd. Research and writing by Mari Minette. Music is by Kevin McCloud, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Unless otherwise stated in the episode, the places mentioned in the broadcast are not paid or contact us for any type of promotion. Please check out our webpage for credit and sources for the episode. Thank you.